Welcome everybody to the TCARAM uh, 2021 student trainee rounds. This is our first session and I just want to briefly take the opportunity to explain to everyone uh, the background of these rounds and what we're hoping to achieve with this. So this is a competitive seminar series and our goal is to really highlight the innovative and outstanding research that's being led uh, by our trainees at the intersection of artificial intelligence and healthcare across the University of Toronto graduate, uh, undergraduate, in some cases, and professional programs. It's really important that we profile the great work that our trainees are doing, which is why we specifically created this dedicated space to uh, showcase this trainee work. Uh, it's competitive, meaning you're seeing the best of the best, uh, adjudicated abstracts to, to get into this program. Um, and, and just a snapshot, there are, there's much work happening across the university, but you're just seeing um, some of the top work. Ideally, uh, we had hoped to have uh, this session as a half day or day long event where we'd be getting together and interacting. Of course, uh, because of COVID, we had to shift online. So we're doing this modified format for this year where we'll have we have 10 trainees in total. We'll have two uh, presented each, se each session and it'll happen sprinkled throughout the year. So uh, look for other uh, notices when you'll hear from the other trainees. At the end of the 2021 series, we will select uh, a winner. And so you'll hear all about that as well. So without further ado, I'd like to jump right into our first uh, two trainees, and I'm going to uh, introduce, just tell you their names overall, but I will introduce them in more detail before they speak. So we have Tahira Yasmin, who's a PhD candidate from uh, Industrial Engineering at U of T, and Sujay Nagaraj, who's in the MD-PhD program at U of T. So Tahira Yasmin is our first uh, presenter, and I'll just give you a little bit of background and tell you what you're going to hear, and then we'll go ahead and get started. She's currently a PhD student at the University of Toronto and she specializes, as I mentioned, in industrial engineering. Her research focuses on the application of operations research and machine learning in smart, smart hospital applications. She's originally from Bangladesh where she uh, completed her MASc and BSc degrees in industrial engineering. And uh, she works now at U of T, both as a teaching assistant and a graduate researcher in several projects, uh, specifically at McKenzie Health Hospital. And today she's gonna to present to us how hospitals can use AI to improve bed planning and reduce wait times in emergency departments. So thank you again for joining. Uh, congratulations to hear on being selected and over to you. Thank you, uh, thank you Dr. Arozola for uh, the introduction and uh, Tikaram for giving us this opportunity to present uh, a part of my PhD research, which is a machine learning approach to predict the number of beds that will require cleaning and staff uh, requirements in the emergency department. Uh, so I welcome you all uh, to listen to my work and any feedback is definitely appreciated at the end. So uh, excess wait times in emergency department is a global issue and we all have faced it in some time of our life when we visited the emergency department. So the, based on different research, the contributors to excess wait times in uh, ED can be classified as input, which can be defined as like the arrivals and aspects of patient flow uh, in the ED and uh, the next contributors can be throughput, which is actually the bottlenecks within the ED, for example, inadequate staffing. Uh, then the next, uh, the other contributor is output, which is can be uh, defined as bottlenecks in other parts of the healthcare system. For example, hospital bed shortage or discharge delays. Uh, based on other research, one of the major contributors in from all these uh, variables or uh, indicators are delay in bed cleaning. So, which is seriously impacted by the number of staff uh, required in the ID. So, inadequate staff to clean the bed. Uh, that will actually lead towards a delay in bed cleaning, which will, lead, uh, which will leave the patients waiting for a bed in ED, and that will ultimately make the ED crowded. Um, we have recently seen that machine learning algorithms are widely being used uh, for identifying the number of bed uh, requirements in the hospital to identify the mortality rates or the number of ED admissions. Uh, but however, to our knowledge, there has been no research yet that has uh, used machine learning algorithms to predict the number of beds that will need to be cleaned in the next few hours. So therefore, uh, the objective of my research is to build a predictive 
model uh, to predict the number of beds uh, that will require cleaning in ED in four hour periods using machine learning, machine learning algorithms. And um, for that purpose, I will go through some descriptive and diagnostic analytics as well, uh, which will where I will apply and validate the model using retrospective data from the client hospital and identify some uh, important variables. And then after when I'm done with the predictive analytics, um, there will be some prescriptive analytics ad, as well to identify the benefits of this prediction in decision making in capacity planning or resource allocations such as staffing uh, in, the, in the emergency department. So um, now I'll be uh, going through the general patient flow at the emergency department. So usually in emergency department, patients arrive uh, either by walking or by ambulance. Uh, then they undergo uh, triage and registration by a nurse. Uh, then they are placed in a chair or a bed in the AD for uh, the, next, uh, the next step, which is assessed by a provider. So when uh, the provider is assessed, uh, then a decision can be made that the patient can be discharged from ED or further consultation can be asked. Uh, so after the further cons consultation, the patient can be either discharged or have a decision of admission inside the hospital. Uh, so when the patient have admission decision, then they wait for a bed uh, to get a bed from the inpatient ward. Uh, then a bed for that particular patient is assigned. And when the bed is assigned and the bed is received, then the transportation people come and they take the patient to the inpatient ward and we then call that bed. transportation is complete. So when the transportation comes and take the patient uh, to the inpatient ward, the emergency department bed that the patient was occupying is marked as dirty. And uh, it, it is notified uh, to the cleaners or the staff and they come and then they clean the bed. Uh, whenever a patient is discharged at the very beginning from the ED, then also the bed is marked dirty. So uh, for this research, we are actually trying to identify how many beds are being marked dirty in the next four hours so that the emergency department are well aware how many staff they will need so that they can plan accordingly. Um, for this purpose, uh, we have used various uh, uh, variables, uh, which we call feature engineering. So we have eight date related information inside our model, which are, for example, our day of the week, month, season to capture the temporal information in our uh, model. And then we have some process related variables, uh, the processes that I have just described, everything uh, based on that, the hourly information of ED processes, how many patients were arrived in every hour. So uh, for this model, we are actually, uh, in, we input all the hourly information um, and so that we can get what is the next four hours forecast from the model. And then patient's clinical information, acuity level and chief complaints were included in the model. And then we have some uh, post information which you categorize that other category. Uh, and our target variable is actually the sum of the ED bed marks dirty for the next four hours. So we have used a variety of algorithms such as uh, Poisson regression or random forest, gradient boosting, uh, then we used RNN uh, LSTM model and uh, elastic net regression, but based on that wide variety of uh, algorithms, we have uh, uh, the best results from Poisson regression and, uh, and from uh, gradient boosting. So Poisson regression is basically assumes that the response variable Y has a Poisson distribution and assumes the logarithm of expected value can be modeled uh, by linear combination of unknown parameters. Where gradient boosting, it has input requirements. It, we need to give a loss function to optimize, a weak learner to make prediction, and an additive model to add weak learners to minimize the loss function. So the way gradient boosting works is at first it creates a base model from all the features. And then uh, from that base model, it calculates residuals or errors uh, based on the decision tree. And then it keeps adding all uh, like multiple decision trees based on the input and uh, provide an overall prediction that like that can create, like minimize the overall prediction errors. We have also used cross-validation and hyperparameter tuning in our model as well. So 
Cross-validation is one of the techniques that is used to test the effectiveness of a machine learning model. And it is also a resampling procedure uh, used to evaluate a model if we have a limited data. So um, for this research or for the study, we used uh, expanding window k-fold cross-validation because we have a time series model. And um, this cross-validation allows us to validate where validation set is, uh, set is always ahead of the training split. Uh, then we used grid search method in our uh, analysis as well. So grid search is arguably the most basic hyperparameter tuning method. Uh, with this technique, we simply build a model for each possible combinations of all the hyperparameter values provided, evaluating each model. And then finally, we select uh, the architecture which provides the best results. So for example, for um, gradient boosting model, we provided a range of parameters like uh, learning rates, then how many number of trees we want in our model, 10, 30, 100, 20, or 300, then maximum, how long should be the tree? Should be three leaves, four or five or six or eight. And then uh, from analyzing all this combination, the model gives us the best result. Um, so this particular research was actually partnered with uh, Sodexo Canada and McKinsey Health Hospital. So Sodexo Canada is a third party vendor uh, who provides uh, environmental support services to McKinsey Health Hospital. And the members of environmental support services team clean approximately 70 ED beds every day, which increases to around 110 uh, during like, crisis moments. Um, there is uh, one EVS staff to clean the beds from 8 a.m from 12 a.m. to 8 a.m., like late in the nights, and rest of the day there are two members to clean the beds. And it usually takes uh, 30 minutes to clean a bed, but uh, uh, for this particular study, we wanted to see if uh, the KPIs, like if uh, the organization or the hospital wants to clean a bed within 15 minutes, uh, how the outcome should come. And we have uh, data from September 2017 to July 19 uh, that we used in this study from McKinsey Health Hospital. Um, so uh, now I'll be going through some of our de um, descriptive analytics. Uh, so we have information on patients from like around uh, 200 to 2,000 patients. Then uh, the waiting time after triage to get a bed in ED was around 44 minutes. And usually from the historical data, it uh, takes around 30 minutes with uh, around 28 minutes or 29 minutes of standard deviation to clean the bed. Uh, uh, in the data, we have seen seven different modes of arrival, but later we grouped it into two walk and ambulance to uh, increase the generality of the uh, model. And then we use 17 different type of shift complaints uh, where the 17 major categories are provided by Canadian Emergency Department Information System. So uh, all the hospitals use it. Uh, then for this particular hospital, if we go through what's happening in every hour uh, in terms for cleaning the bed. Uh, so here the blue line, the top line, it shows how many ED beds are marked dirty in every hour of the day. And then the orange line is showing how many beds are being cleaned every hour of the day. And uh, the red line is showing how many transportations are coming every hour. And uh, the green one is just the difference between the dirty and clean. So as we, you can see that uh, later part of the day, uh, which is uh, like around uh, 3 to 9 p.m., it has most of the bed, like it has a majority number of beds uh, dirty uh, or, uh, and, the, and majority of the beds are clean. So the workload is higher later part of the day. And uh, also you can see that always the number of beds dirty is higher than number of beds clean. So definitely they need to have some plan of resource allocation so that um, this difference can be mitigated. And then we also uh, measured uh, how long it usually takes to clean a bed in different part of the day. So as uh, we see that the later part of the day has higher number of beds to clean, uh, it usually takes longer time, like more than average 30 minutes time uh, to clean the bed. Uh, Later, uh, after all this descriptive analytics, uh, we fit the models uh, into our algorithms and we used, for training purposes, we used data from September 2017 to April 2019 and the uh, two months worth of data from May to 19 to June is actually used for testing purposes. So I'll be showing the top two results from all the algorithms that we used. So as you can see, the first graph is from Poisson regression, uh, which shows uh, that the error is 
around 13.65 percentage uh, in prediction. And for gradient boosting, the error is quite uh, similar as well, like 13.75 percentage. So if you uh, look closely to the graph, uh, the yellow line is actually the, uh, the actual number of beds are, that are dirty in every four hours. And then the blue line is actually the historical average. Uh, if there were no machine learning model, then looking at the average would give some idea to the hospitals that what's going on uh, in terms of number of beds being dirty. And then or like how, and then uh, the, the red line is actually showing our predicted results. So if you compare uh, the results from Poisson regression and gradient boosting model, the Poisson regression was way better in terms of finding some of the peaks or extreme cases, uh, whereas gradient boosting was not actually uh, that much better in finding out uh, peaks. Therefore, for our further uh, reporting purpose, uh, I will be using the Poisson regression model. So now we have the predictions for each, uh, for every four hours, how many beds are required, but how this prediction can actually help any organization in decision-making. So to identify that, I'll be going through some predictive analytics. So uh, some of the things that we can assist in, uh, in helping the decision making that to identify how many staff are actually needed. And if the hospital choose, uh, have over prediction in the number of the stuff, uh, what it should be the cost? Should they choose it? Or if they choose that we will go un under prediction of the number of the uh, stuff that's required, then what should be the cost and uh, how this model actually can help them in assisting that. Uh, so identify the number of staff requirements, we used a queuing model. So our queuing model is uh, widely used in uh, operations research field where we have arrival as forecasted dirty beds from our forecasting model. And then this uh, forecasted dirty beds are aligned in the queue and then the cleaners come and clean it. So we call it a system service. And then when the beds it's cleaned, it's out of the system. So uh, for that purpose, we have like Lambda, which is average arrival rate per hour, which we're getting from our forecasting model. And then um, since we want to see the, like since we want to see the results, uh, if we have 15 minutes time to take uh, clean the bed, the total time in the system, we consider it as 15 minutes. And then um, uh, where 12 minutes it's take clean the bed and three minutes is the waiting time. So after analyzing all these parameters through queuing model, we figured out that the, usually if there is one bed coming per hour as 30, then the one stuff should be enough to clean the bed within 15 minutes. If there are two to four beds uh, from the forecasting models, then uh, two stuff should be fine. And then uh, if there are like five to seven, then three staff should be uh, hired or, and so on. So how this is actually helping uh, or how this is actually showing the organization how they're performing or how our model is performing. So if we, you look at the top graph, it's kind of showing what's happening currently. So currently there are in this uh, hospital, McKinsey Health Hospital, they have like around 70% of the time two staff working to clean the beds and the uh, rest of the 30% uh, of the time they have like um, one staff and then what happened actually? So in the second graph, you should you can see that uh, there are actually 50% of the time uh, they should have two number of uh, like two staff working. Then 20% of the time there should have three, or uh, around 27% of the time there should have been one staff. And um, then the last one, this graph is showing what is our model is saying. So our model is saying 80% of the time there should have been two staff and 20% uh, of the time there should have been three and 0.4% of the time there should have been one staff. Um, so this is what the number of staff of the staff needed uh, to like, clean away within 15 minutes for uh, this particular hospital. So now if the hospital choose that, no, we want not just to uh, focus on a particular number, but rather we want a range and identify what is the cost of over prediction, what is the cost of under prediction and what kind of uh, prediction or number of stuff we can have for a wide range of value. So usually the cost of over prediction for hospitals uh, in such cases would be idle stuff. If they have more 
uh, staff prediction uh, and then the cost of the extra staff and then if they underpredict, uh, then the KPI that they want to clean that bed within 15 minutes will not be maintained and the emergency department will be crowded. Uh, so depending on what is uh, the decision making criteria of any organization, we used uh, quantum loss to provide a wide range of uh, results so that uh, the hospitals can take decision based on whatever their uh, criteria for decision making is. So quantile loss is actually a loss function that is applied to predict quantile. So a quantile is the value below which a fraction of observation in a group falls. So for example, a prediction of quantile uh, 0.9 should over predict 90% of the time. Um, so uh, based on that, uh, I have created a wide range of predictions. Uh, for example, if it's a predicting, like if it's over predicting 10% of the time or 5%, 50% of the time or 90% of the time. So as you can see in the graph that um, the way the penalization or uh, like over prediction increases, uh, this green line shows, uh, so the blue line actually shows what is happening in current. So, Currently, around like 45% of the time, it will predict exactly what happened, and then the 35% of the time, it will predict over. And then, as soon as I'm increasing the penalty or increasing over prediction, uh, uh, the number of over prediction or having an extra staff idle is increasing, uh, whereas the total number of prediction is in, like, increasing as well. So, what that means is like uh, if the hospital wants to clean the bed within 15% of the time. Uh, in any of this prediction or in any of this range, it is possible that 80% of the time they can clean the bed within 15 minutes, but at the cost of over prediction. So there might be some times when a staff will be uh, like idle. So it depends on what their decision criteria is. Uh, then also we have provided a classic basic classification model. If none of the forecasting are working or uh, is there, then this basic classification model would give uh, when there would be a no, uh, like when the ED would be not crowded, if the ED is moderately crowded, or if the ED is crowded, so that they can have a quick decision. So, for example, from our model, we have seen that um, uh, when our model says uh, that next four hour will not be cried, crowded, most of the time it's actually not crowded. But for the other two cases, we found that. Um, if the model says that it would be moderately crowded or crowded, then 50% of the time it might be true or it might not be true. Um, so that brings towards the conclusion of, um, of this study. So if, we, if I summarize, then in the study, I have done uh, a descriptive analytics of the data, which helped to construct a predictive model based on various algorithms with 77 total features. And then from the prescriptive analytics, uh, predictive analytics, I have, uh, we have concluded on some prescriptive analytics where we provided um, or we assessed uh, the organization in decision-making how many staffs they required, provided a range for under and over prediction and provided a classification model to help them, help them in um, assist in decision-making further. So some of the limitations of the study is that there might be some data quality issues uh, that we had some missing information. So for that, some of the results might not be uh, a little deviated and uh, like might be a little deviated and also we don't have data from another hospital which actually leads us towards our future research that uh, use data from other hospitals to validate this model and see how it's helping other hospitals to uh, assist in, in decision making and since I have used all the variables that are generally uh, like all the variables that are like general variables from an ED, it's easily replicable to any other organization which have a standard emergency department. Um, so that's all. Any questions is welcome. Wonderful. Thank you, uh, Tahira, for that wonderful presentation, for kicking us off, showing where we're having actual impact in healthcare. Um, we have time for a couple of questions. So uh, there's there's a couple of questions in the chat, but I'll start with our uh, group here, um, who would like to start off? You can either just come off mute or come put your hand up. Sean, would you mm -hmm. like to go for Professor sure. Hill? Yes. First of all, thank, thank you very much for this presentation. It was uh, very well presented. I, um, 
I was trying to understand a little bit, you know, where, and, and you did address some of this in your talk, but where the greatest impact is, um, you can imagine as a general manager of, of this facility, you sort of have a good sense of typical, like the typical flow mm -hmm. of, of, of how many patients are coming in and then uh, how many people you need to have on board. So the, the place where the, the model would seem to have the greatest impact would be for those rare events mm -hmm. where you don't really know. Um, and so part of what I wanted to, to understand and, and see if you looked at it at all was, was understanding, um, you know, one thing would be kind of seasonal changes. And I, I know you took into account seasonal variations. Um, of course, the specific date of a holiday, um, the, the weather is something that um, I had actually, some physician friends of mine had, had said that actually one of the greatest predictors of children's injuries is um, when it's good weather out and then you have kids going to the playgrounds and breaking arms and legs and collarbones. Um, so I wanted to get a little bit of a sense, like what is most predictive of these rare surges, like these, some of these rare events, do you have any kind of correlation or did you do, did you kind of get a sense of when you have those, those, those kind of rare events, what, what is, is there anything that's, that's kind of indicative for those? Um, uh, so we actually tried to identify that uh, from the very beginning of this study, like what is this peak is, like why this peak is coming from, or where is this coming from? Is it weather or it is, uh, the season or it is just the part of the hour of the day. Um, so that's why I did that descriptive analytics and we see that hour, uh, hour of the day has very uh, like important aspect right. uh, of it. And then uh, through the predictive modelings, we found that uh, uh, there is a correlation between long weekend. If it's a long weekend, mm -hmm. uh, then some of these peaks are uh, occurring and then Season also has an impact. I did not particularly like put weather in terms of like temperature, but I tried, uh, I have like day of the year. So one, two, 365, so that it kind of, mm. know uh, with the variation. The average, of yeah. 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 And so uh, it actually has an impact, like which day of the year it is. So I think those are uh, rather not related to process, but rather temporal events that has impact of this, of this spikes. Okay, great. So just one, one other question um, is in terms of the, I mean, you're basically, if you think about putting this into operation, you're, you're kind of plugging in numbers um, at a specific time of day, right? You're kind of saying at this point, we have this many people coming in. Yeah. And, and I guess part of the question is this, and, and again, I think you you know you you may have looked at some of this, but what is the what are some of the time constants? I mean, you you have your procedural modeling of, of of the process, but what are some of your time constants of what's the lag for, and your ability to predict for a given lag? So you you were looking at four hour windows, mm -hmm. but is that the right time constant for your prediction? Um, do you, do you yeah. follow what I'm I'm asking? Um, yeah, so uh, I used all the hourly information. So that's the minimum, uh, like the the lag or the difference I wanted to capture. And I forecasted four hours ahead because usually a shift is eight hours. So uh, we wanted to capture like, okay, if it's the middle of the shift so that everybody is aware of, or if it's the beginning or end of the shift so that uh, during that switching time, they have uh, the knowledge what's happening next. So that was basically the logic behind that four hours. It has like no scientific uh, ex like uh, explanation. But, rather it, but it's operationally operational, important. Yeah, yeah, rather still. operational. Yeah. So, so you could say maybe if you can call people in for the next shift. Yes. Yeah. It, so like, yeah, if we know uh, four hours, so suppose the next shift is at 4 p.m. And at 12 p.m., we know that after next four hours, there would be like a number of beds to like a, a great number of beds are coming as dirty so from the beginning of the shift you can bring someone else extra who are like probably floating around the hospital uh, to help for th those particular hours okay great thank you very much thank you great so we'll go over to uh Vinyas for the next question and there's a, a couple in the chat i might just ask one of them go ahead great thanks so much for a wonderful presentation it's very clear how 
this algorithm could be deployed and put into practice to hopefully have impact. And I want to build off of Professor Hill's question with, let's say your algorithm was put into practice at a hospital, right? And your training data went up to, I believe it was the end of the summer of 2019. Yeah. But in January of 2020, we had this huge event that would cause a big distribution shift in the data, right? Mm -hmm. exactly. So if you were, you know, advising stakeholder at the hospital, what would you do? Would you say, we can't trust this model anymore? Or would you try retraining it as you go? Uh, so there could be multiple issues. Uh, since it's a rare event and it's just occurred all of a sudden. So definitely there would be no historic data to train the model. Um, so definitely this model will not properly serve directly, but they need some tweaking in terms of maybe first couple of weeks training data and see how it's performing or how different number of stuffs or how the arrivals are changing. So based on that, I think that uh, Whatever, whatever the feature we have, whatever the algorithm we have, it will work perfectly, but we need probably a few weeks of data to train what that's how it can capture, yeah. Great, thank Great you. Great work once again. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Okay, I'm gonna ask you one last question just quickly if you could, this came in the chat. And then there's another question in the Q&A uh, to hear if you could respond, type the response in afterwards um, during the next presentation, sure, that would be great. But this question, just very briefly, so you, you're you working with a hospital, is it being used to drive uh, staffing currently? This, this question came up in the chat. So is it be actually being used to inform strategy at the moment? Or is it still um, in development stage? No, it's still in development step. It hasn't been deployed yet, but I know that there is a uh, talk or meeting going was going on before pandemic that if they could apply this. Yeah. Uh, but right now it's in halt, as we all know, like Absolutely. everything else in the hospital. So yeah, probably, yeah. but this year, great value. We had meeting from the top management this year, great value of this kind of models. And for this particular hospital, they use Epic uh, electronic uh, data collection methods. So it will not be a problem for them to deploy this kind of additional mo model. So uh, that's there fantastic. Is, yeah. Yeah, great to hear. Okay, so please uh, respond. There's a couple of really good questions in the Q&A. If you could attend to those, that'd be fantastic. Thank you again, um, thank you. virtual clap. Uh, and thank you for kicking us off. Such yeah. a great talk. So we're gonna move now to Sujay Nagaraj. If you wanna, Sujay, pull up your screen, I'm just gonna introduce you. Uh, so Sujay's our, our second speaker and is enrolled in the MD PhD program at the University of Toronto. And he's also pursuing his PhD in computer science under the supervision of Dr. Anna Goldenberg and Dr. Sebastian Goodfellow. His research interests lie at the intersection of machine learning and medicine. And the presentation you're going to hear today is a collaboration with the Lawson Labs at SickKids, which have been collecting high frequency physiological waveform data from uh, the pediatric ICU for several years and exploring how this data could be used to leverage and improve patient care. So you'll uh, hear about some of that work today and over to you, Sujay. Uh, thanks, Laura. Hey, everyone. My name is Sujay, and uh, as Laura mentioned, I'm an MD-PhD student at the University of Toronto, uh, and I'm excited to share with you all some of the cool work we've been doing at the Critical Care Unit um, at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. So over the past five years or so, at SickKids, we've pervasively captured, stored, and analyzed high-frequency physiological waveform data, sampled it up to 500 hertz from all critically ill patients at all points of their stay. As you can imagine, this provides a rich source of information to understand both patient risk and physiological state. Unfortunately, data can sometimes be difficult to interpret due to artifacts in the data. And traditionally in waveform analysis, artifacts are actually removed before any analysis is done. However, we noticed that one specific clinical event, in this case, the accessing of lines such as central, venous, or arterial lines is actually associated with a distinct and characteristic artifact. And so instead of removing these artifacts from analysis, we actually sought to detect them in real time to provide additional insights about um, the frequency of line axes at the bedside. And you might be wondering why we actually care about these line axes. And the reason is the lines are um, really frequently used in the unit and they're a direct conduit from the outside environment into a patient's central circulation. Um, they're used routinely to get blood samples for labs, biomarkers, as well as for medication administration. And unfortunately, the overutilization of these lines 
is associated with adverse outcomes such as bloodstream infections, which is a um, significant contributor to morbidity and mortality in a critical care unit. Current means of documenting these line accesses are uh, manual uh, entering to the EHR, which are subject to error, omission, and bias. So we think that we can maybe do a better job by automating this process um, and also alleviating some of the documentation burden for our bedside nurses. In addition, it opens doors for a lot of quality improvement initiatives. After all, the common adage is you can't improve something that you can't adequately measure. So to give you guys a little bit of context, this is um, what our waveform data looks like. This is arterial blood pressure waveform sampled at 125 hertz. On the bottom, you can see um, what one second looks like. So that's 125 measurements in a second. Um, and in the top right, if you attract your attention there, this is actually the artifact that we're interested in. So this artifact occurs during every single line access. And as you can see, it's quite different from physiological waveform data in terms of morphology and amplitude. Uh, we like to affectionately refer to these guys as shark fins, and I'm gonna be calling them shark fins for the rest of the talk as well. So our whole goal here is to develop and deploy a machine learning tool that's capable of accurately detecting catheter access events or shark fins in real time. Now here's how we actually ended up doing that. So we had a labeled training data set of 1800 of these shark fin events that were obtained from manual clinical observations. We held out one continuous series of these shark fin events. So uh, 548 events that occurred in the continuous span of a, around a year of waveform data. And with the rest of the shark fins, we split them into one minute intervals and put them into training validation and test sets. We also made sure that we had sufficient examples of non shark fin data as well. So this includes normal physiological blood pressure waveform data, but also other noise and artifacts um, that occur in the waveform that aren't necessarily shark fins, but are intended to try to confuse the model to make, to make it as specific as possible. Each one minute interval was Z-score normalized based on the previous 10 minutes of blood pressure waveform. And this was done to account for interpatient variability in baseline blood pressure. As you can imagine, the blood pressure of a neonate is gonna be vastly different than the blood pressure of a 15 year old teenager. So in order to detect the shark fins, we built a convolutional neural network trained as a binary classifier. Essentially how this works is discrete one minute windows uh, with labels associated with them, in this case, uh, non-shark fin or shark fin are passed into the model um, and uh, convolutional layers are intended to ex work as feature extractors to try to learn this characteristic shape. And finally, the model outputs a sigmoid score or uh, which can be interpreted as kind of a probability that a shark fin is present within a window or not. And with many examples um, and calculating our error rates um, and backpropagating our losses and updating our weights in our model, we're able to um, uh, settle on some optimized model, which is um, theoretically strongly capable of identifying specific windows and if they contain shark fins or not. So here's how the model actually performed on the holdout test data set on discrete windows. This is on over 2000 discrete one minute windows of waveform with 270 shark fins there. The model was quite accurate, it was highly sensitive and specific, and we were pretty confident that it seemed like it was doing a good job of detecting this characteristic shape. Now, that's all exciting, but what does this actually mean for practice or in a more realistic streaming context? So uh, the examples that I showed you are from the model being optimized on a window test set. So that's one minute discrete windows of shark fins. And we think that we achieved the goal, which is to learn to detect the char characteristic shape of this artifact. That being said, the real world data is a lot noisier. There's gonna be more class imbalance. Maybe there's other artifacts that we haven't uh, necessarily seen in our test data set that might kind of confuse our model. So we wanna make sure that before we do any kind of prospective implementation, we're adequately testing in a, um, in an, in a simulated environment. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, we held out um, uh, one continuous set of waveform data from several months, almost a year of continuous data. As you can imagine at 125 hertz, that's a lot of data points. And within that scattered throughout were 548 unique shark fin events. And so we had these labels and as you can imagine, um, over the course of a year, that's kind of like finding 548 needles in a massive haystack. And the goal here is to sort of take our model, run it on all this data and see how well it performs in those kind of simulated prospective deployment. Um, we're trying to mimic um, online inference. Uh, we're trying to replicate the class imbalance that's going to be found in real world data, as well as the other kinds of noise that are, that are bound to be present in a real world situation. So how do we take our um, discrete model that's trained on taking one window at a time and turn it into this continuous streaming context? 
And the answer to that is a method that's widely used um, in similar time series models. It's called sliding windows. Basically, we have a fixed length window. In this case, it's a minute. And we slide it along um, uh, the time series at intervals of, um, in this case, 30 seconds. And so uh, at some point, we're going to detect a shark fin. And then hopefully, the model picks it up. And we can store that data. And so that's kind of how we convert this discretized setting into a continuous time series setting. One um, issue with translating to simulated prospective, um, uh, to simulated data and continuous time series is how do we actually measure our metrics for success? So precision and recall is a commonly used method in, um, in any classification task. And in a binary classification task with discrete windows, it's really easy to calculate your precision and your recall um, or your sensitivity and specificity or what have you. Um, you have specific labels for your real ground truth, and you have labels that are outputted by your model. And you can find these intersecting sets to try to see how well your model is performing. But what if um, in our streaming context, we have a ground truth label that uh, shows our artifact, and our model kind of predicts a region that's slightly bigger than that? Or what if in a streaming context, we predict two separate windows that are slightly misaligned from that? And so it becomes kind of difficult to actually calculate precision and recall in a continuous time series setting. So we turned to a paper that was published a few years back at NeurIPS, where they actually tackled this very problem. Um, so in their implementation, they're able to take the discretized form of precision and recall and adapt it to a continuous time series context, which includes weights for um, whether we care about just finding the artifact or not, whether we care about um, how much overlap there is with the ground truth, um, as well as the number of windows that we're predicting on versus the, uh, the uh, versus like, so for example, two windows of predictions versus one continuous shark fin region. And so we were able to use these metrics to actually evaluate on our uh, simulated deployment. So here's how the model actually did. Um, we were also able to use a scenario to actually tweak some hyperparameters. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the sliding setting, so the number of seconds that the window slid along the time series is going to be an important hyperparameter. So we were able to test that out as well as the actual window size of a minute. And we're also able to play around with different thresholds. And so in a binary classification task, when the model spits out a sigmoid uh, probability score, we can set a threshold of, for example, 0 0.8. And anything uh, greater than that is classified as a shark fin. And anything less than that is going to be classified as a non-shark fin. And by playing around with uh, these thresholds, we're able to see that uh, there's definitely a trade-off in precision and recall. Um, as we increase our threshold, threshold, we increase our model specificity. So it's uh, capturing less false positives. Um, that being said, though, increasing the threshold too much makes sure, means that sometimes we miss some artifacts that some shark fins that um, we wouldn't that we would have captured otherwise. And so combining the precision and recall into an aggregated F1 score, we were able to kind of find a sweet spot where um, uh, there's kind of this optimized F1 score and an optimized threshold that um, is able to have an F1 score of 0 0.9 on several months of continuous waveform data. And it's able to find those 548 uh, excuse me, shark fins that are scattered throughout. So here's, um, so now that we've kind of tested this in this retrospective context, we really wanted to see how well we can actually do this in real time in the ICU um, from all bed spaces 24 seven. So we were able to build out a prospective deployment pipeline. Um, how it works is we um, are consuming data from our Philips monitors at the critical care unit. Data is stored in our proprietary database called HMDB. From here, we use a messaging queue called RabbitMQ, which consumes data from the HVMDB and packages them into nice discrete chunks of waveform. Alongside that, we have a lot of metadata like the timestamps, um, the bed space IDs, et cetera, that are pushed into this queue in a first in, first out format. And then on the server side, we have a consumer, which is just the Python program that works to ingest data from the queue and aggregate them into their appropriate um, bed spaces. So we're making sure that we're not confusing different patients and we're making sure that things are time aligned properly and that we have sufficient buffers of like uh, data so we can do our pre-processing steps before analyzing it. Once that's done, we have worker bees, which are um, multi-threaded Python programs, which have instances of the model running on them. And then they consume data from our buffers and then they output a sigmoid probability score. Um, all of this information, including the timestamps of the prediction, the metadata from the bed space, uh, we're, we're also storing in a SQL database. Um, and right now we're doing this right now in the critical care unit um, from all beds um, who have an arterial line 24-7. Um, uh, we've been doing this since uh, this model's, this implementation has been running since around December. And we have um, over 10 million entries in our database already. 
So now that we do that, how do we actually operationalize this and move towards this path of translation? And here's kind of where we're at right now. Uh, recently, we submitted a REB and were approved at the at the SICKIDS, by the SICKIDS REB to run a uh, prospective non-interventional trial of our model. Um, we also call this a silent trial or a silent period evaluation or a, or a shadow trial. Um, basically, the idea is the model is going to be running in the background. Uh, the outputs aren't going to be shown to anybody, but we're going to get a ability to uh, one, gather labels to correlate this um, clinical intervention to this artifact, verify that the model is performing on real-time streaming data, um, and then also test the um, constraints of our implementation framework to actually make sure that um, you know, there's no holes in our deployment structure. Next, we're going to be comparing to current documentation practices. So as I mentioned, the current standard of documentation is to the EHR record, and we really want to see if the model's predictions align with um, what's currently being documented. And this last step in the direction that we're kind of hoping to move towards soon is um, this idea of integration. So given this model that, um, let's say it's this amazing model that works really, really well, how do we actually integrate this in a scenario that's, that's usable? Um, what results do we need to show to clinicians? Who do we need to show them to? Who are the stakeholders in this context? How do we present this information? And um, uh, there's a lot of interesting design and human computer interaction questions that we're hoping to answer qualitatively in this, um, in this portion of our work. So in terms of applications, um, I alluded to some of them earlier, um, but why is this work useful? So one, from a quality improvement standpoint, uh, this work can allow us to design initiatives to reduce line access um, utilization by using highly accurate information about utilization patterns. So if we know that our model is really good at picking up um, uh, the frequency of line access utilization in our units, we're able to maybe correlate that with some um, uh, adverse outcomes that are occurring in the unit, such as line access, uh, sorry, such as bloodstream infections, to work to mitigate um, line access utilization. In addition, um, we think that this model will also be um, helpful by alleviating some of the documentation burden. As I mentioned, um, currently the standard of documentation for these accesses are manual, and so we think that by automating this process, that's, that's a little bit of extra time saved for our bedside nurses. Additionally, one thing that's really interesting about this work is that it kind of changes the perspective of what we traditionally think of as artifacts and waveform data. Um, this tool can give us a way to ascertain whether there's changing patterns of line access can be a proxy to changing patient status. And what I mean by that is um, each of these artifacts signifies a clinical intervention, uh, a line access to either push medication or to gather more information about your patient. And understanding how the frequency of this evolves over time can gives us a really interesting proxy to um, what either clinicians are thinking about that patient, perhaps they're more worried about them and want more, want more biomarker samples, or perhaps that patient's deteriorating and is getting um, a lot of medication administered in a short period of time. This is a really interesting and um, uh, seemingly like a different way to gather a lot of valuable information from one dimensional waveform um, on its own. Additionally, from a data science perspective, uh, this model can allow us to time align biomarkers and medication administration. Because we know exactly when these catheter accesses occur, we're able to perhaps uh, know exactly to the second when a biomarker or a lab value is measured, as well as to the second when a medication was administered. All of this can uh, be fed into um, our other models that we're hoping to, to deploy in the units, such as our cardiac arrest prediction models or any other model that's, um, that's looking at predicting uh, patient risk using ICD data. Additionally, from a more traditional um, artifact detection standpoint, um, it gives us a, a really easy way to identify periods of time where the waveform data doesn't necessarily reflect patient physiology. So times where um, the data can be cleaned uh, to remove these artifacts for uh, pre-processing before it's piped into a different model. So in summary, data artifacts provide important information about patient state and interventions. We can build simple ML tools to identify these artifacts. The models are accurate and robust to the class and balance and noise of real world data. And we've deployed such a model in the Sick Kids Critical Care Unit running on all beds 24 seven. We're currently gearing up for a prospective trial to evaluate its performance. And we're gonna be engaging with stakeholders qualitatively to ensure that the model is, um, that the model results are meaningful, relevant, and can help augment clinical practice in helpful ways uh, without being burdensome at all. So with that, I'd like to thank um, everyone at the Lawson Labs um, and our collaborators and um, everyone at the Goldenberg Lab as well. And I'm happy to, to take any questions. 
Wonderful presentation. Thank you so much for that. Just fascinating. So we I know got a couple questions uh, here and then I would also um, encourage anyone if you have a question to put it in the Q&A function and we'll try to get to it. So I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Candle if you'd like to uh, ask a question. Yes, uh, thank you very much. That was a wonderful uh, talk. Um, I can see lots of potential um, analyses that coming out of it. Uh, one thing that I wondered about, um, the whole hypothesis is based on these waveforms. And I was really interested to know if you had validated those waveforms in any way. Like, are, did you confirm that it was truly every time there was an access, you, you generated a waveform of a and was that height of that waveform potentially influenced by the type of intervention? And could that all influence your interpretation? That's a, that's a really good question. So our, um, our initial training data set was actually from direct um, at the bedside clinical observations. Um, so people sort of, uh, people watching the Philips monitor associated each of these um, catheter access events with that sort of shark fin shape. Um, the absolute value of that shark fin shape, we don't believe like to be changing much. Uh, the reason why it actually occurs is because uh, when you take, when you're accessing a line, uh, you're required to um, turn a stopcock, which stops the flow to uh, the blood pressure transducer. And the, the rising shape is actually the buildup of pressure because that stopcock is stopped. And so that kind of physical process occurs every single time that stopcock is, is utilized. Um, that being said, though, questions about like duration, um, that's something that we're really interested in actually seeing as well. We're not sure if um, the duration of that stopcock being closed and that uh, the, the amount of uh, time spent to get that sample um, could be correlated with any kind of downstream clinical sequelae. Um, it's certainly possible, but it's something that we're hoping to investigate in our prospective trial. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess to, to answer your more question directly, like uh, the specific uh, observation was, was from a direct clinical observation of, of these events happening and they were correlated with what's on the monitor. Thank yeah. you. Fantastic. Okay, Philippe Morgado, over to you for a question. Hey, Suja. Excellent hey. talk. Uh, really interesting seeing, especially an application that has real-time usage and taking this real-time data. Um, one thing that I was wondering about was you had mentioned that you z-scored the waveforms prior to analysis to account for interpatient variability. I would imagine that um, there would be uh, interesting factors to consider with that come through the interpatient variability. So I was just wondering if you could comment on if you've investigated at all um, the extent of variability you see with patients, how that affects the waveform, mm -hmm. what factors may affect the waveform the most. I imagine things like age, sex, BMI would affect the, the presentation mm -hmm. of the waveform. So I was wondering if you could comment on what you've seen with regards to that. Yeah, so um, specifically with respect to the artifact, um, we don't really have any reason to um, believe that it's tied to, like the artifact, it's like the shark fin itself is tied to any of those factors affecting the normal waveform. Um, but as you said, like certainly um, normal blood pressure physiological waveform will be tied into um, uh, all manners of um, patient demographics and um, other features. Um, the data set that we trained it on um, was um, we didn't actually pipe in any information about um, patient demographics or um, age or sex or BMI into the actual um, convolutional um, neural network because we're only interested in sort of this distinct shape. Uh, but the data set involved um, several months, uh, I think actually years of uh, waveform data that was continuously labeled. Um, and that includes uh, data coming from all the patients at all points in their stay um, when that labeling was done. And so we're hoping that that kind of captured um, like the breadth of kind of diversity that we're expecting to see um, uh, in the critical care unit. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope that answers your question. It does, thanks. Great, so we have a question in the chat from um, Stefan Furlan. Uh, this is a little bit related to the last question, but were you able to associate any particular clinical events with the false shark fins? Uh, yeah, so the, the clinical event itself is um, the actual accessing, the physical accessing of the line. Um, but in order to see if we can correlate um, the, the uh, line utilization with um, downstream events, we kind of have to take a little bit of a step up from a more QI perspective. 
Um, there's a lot of studies um, in the critical care literature that shows that overutilization of these lines is associated with um, adverse events like bloodstream infections. Um, and so what we're hoping to do once this model is kind of validated prospectively is um, have it running, um, output statistics and save these statistics about the utilization patterns um, per line per patient, um, and then say if we ran that for like a year or something like that, um, we could compare that to um, some of our um, reported adverse outcomes um, um, in the unit and see if there's any correlation with um, overutilization of lines um, and the actual downstream event. Um, but uh, all the evidence that's kind of existing in the in the literature so far shows that um, there's a very clear, you know, kind of measurable relationship between overuse of lines and um, infection. And uh, we're just trying to present a better way to measure this kind of overuse um, that's that's more uh, robust to, to human error. Fantastic. Okay, maybe I'll take moderator's prerogative to ask you one last question. Um, and it's about the trial. So definitely uh, interested in, in uh, the work that's coming and the perspective validation. Can you just expand a little bit more why it's so important to test this in a trial format? Um, what do you hope to get from, the, from that particular uh, line of investigation? And, and how do we do more of this uh, perspective validation trial work in AI and medicine? It's a, it's a big question, but big question. <laughs> <laughs> tell, me, tell me a little bit about the thoughts and what you're hoping sure. to get out of it. So I think this is, a, this is pretty unique from everything that we're gonna see. Yeah, I think there's several outcomes that we're hoping to achieve here. Um, one, obviously, we need to make sure that this tool is working really good um, and make sure that this is, is a strong, robust tool that's able to um, deal with you know, the, the technical constraints of all the data that's being thrown at it, um, but also that our infrastructure is robust enough to handle this all, um, and also to make sure that it's actually doing what it's supposed to do. That being said, though, I think, um, and I think a lot of people are realizing this in this kind of translation space, is that just having a good tool isn't enough to have good uptake or use. Um, there's a lot of interesting, I think, design considerations that are going to have to go into how we actually integrate this. Um, a lot of stakeholder engagement, I think, is going to be necessary. Um, a lot of qualitative work to sort of make sure that we identify the actual end users or stakeholders of this tool and design um, ways that showcase the outputs of the model to them that are actually relevant to their work and something that they can actually um, make actionable. Uh, for example, a bedside clinician might want a different output of the model's findings than a QI person looking at the, the unit's aggregate safety um, over a course of a month or something like that. And so uh, I, think, I think we're really excited to like do this kind of exploration. Um, but uh, I'm not sure if I have like a clear cut answer as to how to do that. No, that's perfect. <laughs> I just think, uh you know, we are going to see more and more trials in this space uh, as the year go, years go on. So I think it's, it's really impressive work. So thank you so much. I'd like to actually take this opportunity to thank uh, you, Sujay and Tahira for kicking off our inaugural trainee rounds and doing just a fantastic job. So exciting to see the work that uh, trainees at UFT are leading and at Tikaram, we're just very excited to amplify uh, and, uh, you know, promote this work throughout the university in Canada and the world. So thank you for kicking us off. We hope that you'll join us again. Uh, June 1st is our next session. Two more excellent trainees. Uh, and we hope to see you back then. Stay safe, everyone. Take care. And thank you again, Sujay and Tahira. Thank you.